What's up, YouTube? This is Too Raw for TV. All right, now before I get into this video, I want to give a shout out to Gary Benson, one of my subscribers for contributing to the channel. I want to thank you, Gary, for your contribution, man. You've contributed time and time again, man. You show love to the channel, and I truly appreciate it, man. You don't know how much um, your contributions mean to me as a content creator, man. You know what I'm saying? So I try to be honest. I try to be uh, a truthful. I try to give the best videos I can for you guys. And I want to thank everybody that's contributed to this channel over the past year. Now, this is a video request from uh, Ticket TV. All right. So he wanted me to do a video about my thoughts if you were to switch Kareem Abdul Jabbar and put him on the late 80s, 90s Chicago Bulls, uh, and in reverse, put Michael on uh, the 80s Showtime Lakers. And, you know, I know some people aren't going to agree with me, and some people, you know, this might be a bit of a touchy subject, because some people feel like Kareem is the GOAT. I mean, I see the argument for him, you know what I'm saying, for him being the GOAT. I definitely think he's the greatest college player of all time. And when you incorporate high school, college, and the NBA, uh, you could you could say he's the greatest basketball player of all time. Um, but there are certain things about Kareem's game that limits him from being uh, as... I don't want to say this. Perhaps as effective or as dangerous as Michael could be. And I think if you put Kareem on the Bulls, I don't see him winning six NBA championships. Per, me personally. Um, I, I, I don't really see it. Um, this is the thing. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, as great as he was, whenever he didn't have a dynamic point guard, and honestly, with Oscar Robinson and Magic Johnson, you have the two greatest point guards in the history of the NBA. Both of them were also known for being exceptionally large point guards for their eras. Oscar Robinson was 6'5", 210, 225 pounds when he played. Magic Johnson was 6'8", even though he was listed at 6'9", he was really 6'8", and 215, 220 pounds. So these guys with, with this otherworldly, you know, uh, these otherworldly uh, physical traits as point guards, they had, uh, and being big guards, they were able to do certain things as average point guards like Norm Nixon, uh, who came with, who was the point guard before Magic, were able to do, or weren't able to do. First of all, when you're a six foot five point guard playing in the 1960s and 1970s, okay, you're able to see over the defense. You know what I'm saying? Uh, in those days, Perimeter guards were like, especially earlier in Oscar's career, they were like six foot, six foot one, five eleven. You're six foot five, so you're able to see certain things on the court that other guards at that time are not able to see, and just being a guard with Oscar's uh, Oscar and Magic's skill set, Oscar was a better scorer. The, the, and, and rebounder than Magic. Magic was a, a somewhat slightly better passer. Okay, but both of these guys were triple double threats. Okay, also, you know, say and, and with their passing ability to be to be more precise, they were able and being able to see the floor and see over defenses. They were able to get the ball to cap in a certain way in certain areas. In situations where a guy like Jameer Nelson may not be able to do the same thing. You know, so that was one of the weaknesses 
with uh, the Orlando Magic that I can recall when they played the Lakers. The Lakers not only had big guards comparatively, but the Lakers also had length. Lamar Odom and all these guys that are 6'7", 6'8", you know, 6'8", 6'9", wingspans, you know, they, they gave Jameer Nelson a lot of trouble. And um, that's why, if you remember that series, I recall Jameer Nelson struggling a lot. You know what I'm saying? And they had problems dumping the ball off to a guy like Dwight Howard. Because, you know, centers don't bring the ball up. You got to get the ball to the big man. All right? So the thing that Kareem had when he was with the Milwaukee Bucks and when he was with the Lakers, he had that big, otherworldly, dynamic point guard. And then another thing he had going for him was all these other scoring options and scoring threats. When he was with the Bucks, all right, when they won the championship in 70-71, he had uh, Jim McMillan, okay, who, you know, was a fine scorer in his own right, can get you 15 to 18 points a game easy. And he had the very underrated Bob Dandridge, okay? A lot of people, they hear the name Bob Dandridge, like, who the hell is that? Well, Bob Dandridge is a guy that in his day and age was something like a Kawhi Leonard, okay? He was a two-way player. He was probably the best two-way player in the NBA in the 1970s. Um, if I'm not mistaken, in the 1970s, he's the only guy to average 20 points per game in three different finals. Matter of fact, he's the only guy in NBA history to average 20 points per game in three different finals and who's eligible for the Hall of Fame and is not in the Hall of Fame. But but Bob Dandridge was tremendous, man. Bob Dandridge was huge, actually, in that final series against the Baltimore Bullets. I think they were the Baltimore Bullets still at that time. And, you know, he was the main reason why they were able to win the title. Well, one of the main reasons why they were able to win the title that year. Plus, you got Bob Boozer coming off the bench. Okay. You got Bob Boozer coming off the bench, averaging about 10 points a game. And his days with the Chicago Bulls just earlier, a couple of years earlier in the late 60s, Bob Boozer was scoring 20 points per game. Then you have Lucius Allen, another underrated player. So you got all of this help. So this helps a guy like Kareem to have all these different scoring threats to kind of keep defenses off kilter. They can't just sit there and focus on one guy or one play or one threat. You got all these multiple, you know, threats. All right? Then with the Showtime Lakers, throughout the tenure of the Showtime era, you have great players like James Worthy, okay? James Worthy, who was a 50, 50 all-time great player. In some people's eyes, he's still a top 50. He's definitely still top 60, 65 in my book. All right, you got James Worthy. All right, you have Michael Cooper. You have Byron Scott. You have, uh, for a little stretch, you have Bob McAdoo, a guy who led the league in three consecutive seasons for the Baltimore, for the, excuse me, for the Buffalo Braves in the mid-1970s. He's come up the bench for you. You have Jamal Wilkes, who was a big-time scorer for the for the uh, Golden State Warriors in the 1970s. You have Norm Nixon for a couple of years. All right, Norm Nixon was the first point guard for the for the Showtime Lakers, which people forget. It was Norm Nixon that was the point guard, and Magic was the off guard. It wasn't until I think 83-84, I think, is when they finally when when Pat finally moved. Uh, Magic to the point guard position, and ultimately they traded Norm Nixon to the Clippers. And Norm Nixon, I think his first year with the Clippers, he averaged something like 18 points and 11 assists or something like that. You know what I'm saying? So Norm Nixon was a beast in his own right. All right? So you have all of this, all of these great players and great talent with the Lakers. And a Hall of Fame uh, coach in Pat Riley. You know what I'm saying? So I, like I said, I'm not trying to denigrate Crandall Jabbar at all, but Crandall Jabbar didn't have a lot of help. Okay, um, you've, and you can contrast this with the mid to late seventies before Magic's arrival with the Lakers and after Kareem was traded from the Bucks to the Lakers. Now, don't get me wrong; 
A guy like Kareem Crimble Jabbar, his presence alone will give you an extra 20 victories because he's just such a great, phenomenal player. But when you don't have that dynamic point guard and you don't have, you know, a lot of great players in their primes or, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is like, for instance, one year with the Lakers. All right. Kareem had on that roster Norm Nixon, uh, Lou Hudson from the Atlanta Hawks. He had Adrian Dantley. And it was someone else I remember on the roster. It was Adrian Dantley, Lou Hudson. Oh, man, who else was on that roster? I think Ernie DeGrecio, uh, excuse me, Ernie DeGregorio, who used to play with the Bu- Buffalo Braves on that roster. But it was someone else. Some other great player. Or a player that ultimately was a great, a great player. I can't remember the other guy. And Brad Davis. Brad Davis... We're going. I'm not saying Brad Davis is a Hall of Fame caliber player, but he was a more than solid point guard for the Dallas Mavericks in the 1980s when they had Rolando Blackman, Mark Aguirre, you know, uh, 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 James Donaldson, that team. They were playing with with uh, Kareem, but Kareem's game, you know, said he needs the ball. Okay, um, but you got to give him the ball, and if defenses are just keen on that, you need some other threats out there, and you got to have guys that can work with Kareem. Like you got to have guys whose games are complementary to Kareem, and and more than anything else, like I said before, you a guy like Kareem. They always benefit, these centers, they almost always benefit from a great perimeter player being on their team. If they don't have that, it, it, it kind of, it really hurts the team from being able to perform at a championship level. Just go through the history of the NBA. Okay? If you go through the history of the NBA, George Mikan, for his era now, okay, if people want to say I'm always capping for these guys. Like, like I'm saying, that they're going to score 30 points per game today. But for his era, George Mikan, he had Slater Mark, okay? Bill Russell had Bob Cousy, okay? Uh, Will Chamberlain, when he finally started winning, he had a Jerry West, okay? All right? Uh, you know, Shaq had Kobe, you know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, Tim Duncan, he had Mon Ginobili and Tony Parker. Okay, you know what I'm saying? Like, they, they always had to have some type of these great post players. They need some other great player, usually uh, a perimeter player, to balance off the attack. Even though they never won any goddamn thing, Carl Malone had John Stockton. So that's the thing with a guy like Kareem Jabbar. But Michael Jordan, okay. In my opinion, I can see Michael Jordan winning multiple championships with the Showtime Lakers, and here's why. When you look at what Michael was able to accomplish in Chicago, he didn't really have you know, that talented a team. You know, the only other all-star he had was Scottie Pippen, and Michael helped to Make a guy like Scotty. Scotty didn't come into the NBA gangbusters. Scotty averaged, I think, seven points a game his rookie year. All right, and you know, saying this is a guy out of college, not out of the high school. So Michael helped to develop Scotty into being what he was. He saw the raw, the raw athletic ability and the raw talent, but Michael helped to mold Scotty into being the superstar that he became. Other than Pippen, Horace Grant, 
was solid, okay? Um, but he was no superstar. Dennis Rodman is a Hall of Famer. Let's, no, let's make no mistake about that. He's a Hall of Famer. But Dennis Rodman knew what his limitations were. Dennis Rodman was not a great scorer. Dennis Rodman was a guy that, when he was with the Chicago Bulls, gave you five points a night. Okay? Scoring had to come elsewhere. And more than more often than not, the burden of scoring was on Michael Jordan's shoulders. Okay? He accepted that burden, but it was a burden nonetheless. With the Showtime Lakers, he would not happen to have that burden anymore of scoring. All right? You, you would have... A, a, a dynamic point guard in Magic Johnson who can get you 19 points a game himself. Not only that, you would have Byron Scott if he's still there in this situation. Uh, maybe Byron Scott, you know, comes off the bench. I don't know in this scenario, but Byron Scott was a guy that could get you, you know, 15 to 18 points a night. James Worthy, without having plays called for him, okay, can get you 20 points a night. And he's already familiar with James Worthy because of the North Carolina connection. All right? So you have already, then you have Jamal Wilkes earlier on, uh, Norm Nixon earlier on. Uh, I, I guess some of these guys would come off the bench maybe in this scenario. But Norm Nixon, when he was with the Clippers later on, had a season average in 18 points and like 11 assists or something like that. So, you know, then you had Jamal Wilkes, who was a 25 points per game scorer with the Golden State Warriors in the 1970s. All right. So, and then you have Bob McAdoo coming off the bench. Um, he was a three time scoring champion with the Buffalo Braves. So, in this scenario, Mike would have the most help he's ever had, ever. And I know some people are going to bring up the fact that, well, what about the center position? You know what I'm saying? You don't really have a center. And, I mean, yeah, the, the, the center position would pose a problem. And I understand that whenever the Lakers would face a team like Moses Malone or, or you know, Artis Gilmore or any of the big-name centers at that time, Robert Parrish, they, they would pose a serious threat. The best thing that you have to do in that situation is try to neutralize other players, okay? That's what the Bulls did, okay? You try to neutralize the other players and you just let them guys get off as much as... If they're going to get off, neutralize other players, okay? That's what Michael Jordan would be trying to do defensively. I think Michael would motivate Magic to be even better defensively than he was in real life. Magic was an above average defender, but he wasn't great. But I think Michael could motivate Magic to play defense at a level that he hadn't played before. This is just theory, okay? But still. Um, look, this is the thing I'll say about this too. The Bulls won six championships without having a great center. Okay, And for those who say, well, they never played anybody with a great center in the playoffs, well, look, the bad boy Pistons were able to win two championships, and they didn't have a great center. Okay, Their center was James Buda Edwards, who was not a great center. Wasn't terrible, but he wasn't great. Okay? So, and incidentally, uh, James Buda Edwards was on a couple of those Lakers teams in the 70s when Kareem wasn't winning championships. But when you put him on a team like the Detroit Pistons with a dynamic point guard like Isaiah Thomas, diminutive but dy dynamic, uh, a, a great scorer in Joe Dumars, a great scorer in Adrian Dantley, later on Mark McGuire, and, and all these other pieces, Vinnie Johnson, uh, you know, Dennis Rodman. Now you're winning championships. But and anything, too, without this great big clog in the paint would make Michael Jordan even more dangerous. 
If you think Russell Westbrook was something this year, right? Imagine Michael on a team without a big clogging up the paint with the Showtime look. Let's say, let's say they, they have Bob McAdoo in the starting lineup, okay, playing limited minutes. And and then let's say that he shares minutes with some other some other, you know, average center of that time. Let's just say an average guy. And let's say it's a guy like uh let's say I put it like this, let's say the center was a guy like uh Mike Jaminski, all right? And and he shared minutes with Bob McAdoo at the center position. Jordan have a field day. When, when McAdoo's on the court, McAdoo was was at that time more of a would be more like a stretch four or five, excuse me, his shooting ability, mid range, and Jordan would be phenomenal with that team. Man. He wouldn't average thirty seven points a game because you got too many great scorers on the court, but I can still see Jordan averaging. Just because of the way they played the Showtime Lakers, I can still see them average. I can still see him averaging thirty points, just because of the way they played, and it'll be thirty the thirty most impactful points that you've ever seen. I can see a lot of fast break, like you know, what I'm saying uh, breakaway dunks. I can see a lot of demoralizing dunks from him. I could just see him just putting on an offensive. Display, you know, what I'm saying with the Showtime Lakers, and I and I can see him winning multiple championships. You know, what I'm saying Michael was effective without the basketball. He didn't have to have the basketball in his hands at all times to be a weapon. He learned how to play off the ball, with Phil Jackson. He knew how to play off the ball with Dean Smith. He would have adjusted. As a matter of fact, in this situation, he wouldn't have had to adjust. He would have came right to the Lakers and played within the team concept because he was used to that in North Carolina. All right? And we all know that Pat Riley had the most respect, utmost respect for Michael. He's the only uh, executive in the NBA to have retired his number. So he has the utmost respect. And I can see uh, him and Pat Riley ultimately uh, having a relationship like Phil Jackson had with Mike, you know. And that's my take on it, at least. You know what I'm saying? I think that uh, in this scenario, also I think as the years progress, Michael would just naturally emerge as the leader of that team. Um, you know, Magic might be called the leader, but Michael would be the de facto leader of that team. Um, just because of his personality. And um, as that team got older, I think Michael would have taken the reins of that team more so offensively. And he would could have been the catalyst to take that team to the 90s. And maybe, you know what I'm saying, I, I'm just saying, like, I could see them doing a lot of dangerous shit, man, with him there. Okay? Um... Anyway, that's my take on it. Tell me what you guys think.